This is Unspoiled Special Edition, in which we discuss Stranger Things, the Netflix original series, Chapter 1, The Vanishing of Will Byers. In this episode, there's a mysterious place hidden in town that's doing things that people don't know anything about, and something has gotten loose. Welcome to Unspoiled Special Edition. I like, yeah, you made that sound nice and sinister. (laughs) I like that a lot. What did you think of this episode, Maggie? I'm the spoiled one this time around, so this is fun. I know, this is the first time this has happened. It was really, I gotta say, it was really hard not to go on to the next episode. So I suddenly, I suddenly understand your pain with these Netflix series. Um, But I was good, and I didn't. Um, It was good. It definitely made me want to know what was going to happen next Mm -hmm. because it wasn't exactly what I was expecting the series to be. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a little bit different than I was expecting. And so that piqued my interest. And um, yeah, there was definitely a lot of stuff that I wasn't expecting. So that was, um, it was interesting. I thought there was gonna be a lot more Winona Ryder. I gotta say. Yeah. She, um, I mean, she comes back a little like more later on. But right. she's definitely at this point just getting into the story. Yeah, she. I mean, she's good, but the her role at this point is a little bit like, "Where are my dragons?" Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'm like, stop being Daenerys season two and chill out. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but I understand. I mean, clearly, obviously, um, poor, poor, poor woman. Uh, um, I like the levels of guilt going on between her and her other son, mm-hmm. and there's definitely an interesting family dynamic there that I hope will be explored more. Yeah, this was actually, um, because I had already watched the first seven episodes, but I have not yet finished the series yet. I haven't gotten a chance to by myself. Um, this was something that I had missed the first time, that when Will comes running into the house, they're both gone. Yeah. Because they're both out working. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really notice that or, like, take particular interest in that the first time. And then, you know, going back, I was just like, oh, man, because his family is uh, lower income than pretty much all his friends, I think. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast between his family and the other family, the family... um, where they're the house where they're playing D and D it's going to mm-hmm. take me a while to get the characters names. I swear I will. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, but you know, they have a very much like we're all going to sit around the dinner table and the sisters in her little sweater set. Mm-hmm. And it's very, I wouldn't necessarily say even upper middle class, but they're definitely set, you know, the right. dad works, the mom's home. It's very kind of classic eighties, you know, little nuclear family as opposed to Will's house, which is the dad's gone sleeping with this other rando and Winona is totally strung out. Her, his brother clearly has to work too. He knows how to load a gun. Like there's a a shack in the backyard with a rifle. It's a very different, um, it's, it can, it contrasts very clearly with his friend's family which I liked. And even down to like the fact, I I really loved this detail. And again, I didn't notice it the first time that when they're all riding their bikes home, he has to ride the farthest and he's the one who lives right near or on this property. That's technically owned by the energy company. Right. So it's just, I, a lot of little like setup things that just didn't really like, you know, I'm so focused on, oh, my God, he's getting chased by this fucking thing. <laughs> and uh, once I actually took the time to appreciate that part, I was like, ooh, nicely done, guys. I didn't even, like, see that. 
Yeah. And like when the sheriff comes to the house to investigate and he notices the hole in the wood paneling, first of all, the wood paneling is a nice Mm -hmm. detail. (laughs) I'm like, that's, uh, yeah, the the classy houses don't have the wood paneling in the, in the living room. Um, but he notices that there's a hole where the doorknob has hit because he ran and he, you know, the door sort of flew open and hit the wall and the sheriff says, has this been here? And Winona's like, probably, I don't know. I got two boys, you know, she's too busy Mm -hmm. to keep up with anything that's going on in this house. And she's like, is it trash? Probably. Yeah. (laughs) That's not my concern. I've got other shit on my mind. And I was like, I feel you, Winona. (laughs) (laughs) Um, before we go any further, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Natasha. And I'm Maggie. And, um, this is actually a experimental unspoiled, uh, series. So for those of you who have just found this and are not sure if you are uh, listening to this at any date close to Wednesday, July 20th, 2016, what I'm doing is, um, I created a GoFundMe with a goal of $600 to cover this entire series, um, which is eight episodes long so far, in an accelerated format of recording like three episodes a week. And the goal is to be able to do, like to succeed this time and then be able to do this with other Netflix series in the future because I would really like to be able to... um, give people something to binge listen to after they binge watch the show. So the fact that Netflix releases things all at once can kind of make it tough for me to finish recording on something and have people still be interested in the show by the time we're done. So that's the, uh, the goal here is that, you know, we were, I'm hoping that I reach the goal that I'm able to compensate Maggie for her committing to this, very intense schedule of recording much more frequently on top of recording Agent Carter with me. Um, And that I will be able to um, pay for the hosting for the show. And if we do not reach our goal, we're going to have to stop. So I'm sure you all don't want that to happen because this is going to be great. Right now we are at $155 out of the $600 goal, which is about enough for two episodes. So I figure we record two, and we've been stagnant at 155 for about a day. And I'm hoping that we get past it. And if we do, awesome. If we don't, well, everybody will get their money back, I guess. (laughs) I feel I'm just like, you know, just trying this out and seeing how it goes. Um, So I hope that y'all are willing to contribute to help keep that the series going and to make this something that I can do in the future for other Netflix series. And Stranger Things was just something that I personally really wanted to cover. And it was going to kill me if we had to do it one (laughs) week because it's a really like tense story and that weight was just going to be unbearable. So um, Susan Smith actually suggested that I try this and I was like, this is a brilliant idea. So if you're interested in contributing, please, you can search either Unspoiled Stranger Things on GoFundMe or you can go to uh, uh, facebook.com backslash unspoiled pod and it is pinned to the top of the page on Unspoiled Pod and you can contribute there and get us to goals so that we can continue recording. Um, And yeah, that's the goal. So hopefully we don't have to stop because that would be an enormous bummer. Yeah. Um, but you know, so not everything works out. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't, but I think that it will be, I think people will get hooked enough that they're going to be like, yeah, all I need in, in total is 75 people to donate $8 each. And that is not, even that's, you know, before the 155 that we've already raised. So, right. well, I think we could do it. Can we do it guys? I think we could do it. Make Woo! it happen. Captain. <laughs> I think it's also, it's hard because it's kind of late in the month. Like, I know a couple people are like, oh, I'm kind of running out of cash right now. So right. it's just stupid Netflix for releasing Stranger Things. It is not on the first of the month. Right. <laughs> it would have been more convenient. But, um, I yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think it'll, and, and I want to keep doing it because I definitely, um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, yeah. This, oh, it's such a good show. 
<laughs> I'm really, really excited to finally be able to watch the final episode today. Um, okay, so let's start off at the very beginning. Okay. Um, th- it starts off with this panicky scene under Hawkins National Laboratory, which is owned by the you know energy company. And it is, or part of the energy department. Department energy, of energy. Part, Department of Energy, yeah. Um, and it's set in 1987? 83, I think. 83. What did you think about the backtracking in time and having this be set in the 80s? Um, I think it's a, an interesting concept. I think... Um, I, I, I like the sort of D&D framing device that runs through <laughs> with these kids. And yes. I don't think that, would, that wouldn't that would work um, in this time period because I don't think kids necessarily do that right now. It's a, it seems like a very specifically early 80s detail. Okay. Um, I also, you know, there's a lot going on in this series that reminds me of Twin Peaks. And not, not as much as I necessarily thought it would, but there's definitely stuff in there. And one of the things that's interesting about Twin Peaks is that it's set in the present day, which at the time was 1990, but it's got a lot of details in it that just seem very 50s, like the way that the kids dress and uh, the music everybody listens to doesn't seem like it's in the modern day at all. So I thought it was sort of an interesting way of um, paying an homage to a series that clearly was in the creator's minds to be like, no, no, this is in the past. Like, Mm -hmm. we're just, we're gonna, we're gonna acknowledge it's in the past. Um, Also, one of the other things it really reminded me of was... um, Oh God! What's it called? Um, ET. The no, no. Well, I mean, there's <laughs> definitely ET. Um, but their Flight of the Navigator. Did you ever see you never that as a kid? No, so it was this movie that came out in I think '86 um, about a, a boy who gets he's he's little and he gets. Um, picked up by an alien spaceship, basically, and then dropped back down ten years later, and there's just something very stylistically about the beginning that really reminded me of early scenes in that movie. So I like that too, because having this be in 83 and having that movie be set in, you know, the mid seventies and then mid eighties made that kind of tie together for me too. And have like this little flashback to my childhood and be like, Oh, it's the eighties and he gets abducted. (laughs) I've seen this before, but obviously it's very, very different. Um, but that that sort of rang some bells in my head, too, which I like. Um, there are just a couple things about having it be set in the past that um, make it so those sort of references um, hit for me mm-hmm. that I think were intentional, honestly. Like, if I were to talk to the creators of this show, they'd be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. definitely think – and this – it's it's kind of interesting to me, and I'd be interested to hear from the audience what they thought, too, because um, I'm part of a few different Facebook groups that talk about movies and TV, and there was mostly an incredibly positive response to the series, but there were a couple people who were like, I'm just so tired of these nostalgia pieces, blah, 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 the synthesized mm-hmm. uh, synthesized score is getting really old. And I was just like, oh, my God, I can't agree with you at all. Like, Mm -hmm. I understand the principle of what they're saying, but it felt so incredibly well done that there are some – I don't know if you saw Turbo Kid that just came out. It was Mm -hmm. like a year ago maybe. It That is an example to me of a nostalgia piece that just feels like, oh, my God, okay, we get it. Like, it was so (laughs) ham-fisted that, oh, 80s, weird, right? Let's do fucking Blade – Blade Road Rage Glory. Like, it was like a mashup of all of these different genre pieces that it felt like it didn't have its own story so much as they just, like, pulled a bunch of tropes. And I don't feel that way about this. This feels like its own compelling story that just borrows the visuals heavily or borrows certain, you know, thematically, but not... For plot, I don't feel like it's a crutch. No, I I wouldn't call this a nostalgia piece at all. Like it's, you know, it's set in the past and it has um, those sort of cultural references in there. But this is a story that can happen now. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's 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 totally independent of that time frame setting. The fact that it's in that time frame is an interesting decision, mm-hmm. and I think adds some interesting touches to it. But I don't feel like it's just really screams eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, this could happen now, totally. Mm-hmm. There's no way that it's it's not like something like the Americans where it's clearly like I love the Americans and I love that it's set in the 80s, but it could only be set in the 80s mm-hmm. because it's about Soviet spies. And so all the details about the era are really relevant to the plot and necessary for the plot. This is I don't find it to be um, dependent on that or using it as a crutch, like you said, mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, that's actually exactly what I said was like, um, calling it a nostalgia piece is like really dismissive of how <laughs> it just felt like the wrong way to describe it. But you know, oh, yeah. it's a uh, it's a, an opinion thing. So I'm curious if anybody else who's listening felt that way about it. Um, so yeah, this opens up with the uh, this scientist who is running down this flickering corridor into a elevator that has only one up button Mm -hmm. and he's frantically pushing the button this hallway is super fucking creepy Mm -hmm. there's something about the camera work i don't know if they use like a wide angle lens but it feels almost like the corridor is moving Mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah um it sort of reminded me of that moment in lord of the rings where the ring wraith first is coming to them on the path in the woods Mm-hmm. And the way that the path, like, they sort of change the the angle and it looks like it's looming for a moment and, like, a pro- like coming at Frodo. Sure, yeah. Um, and he's pressing the button, pressing the button. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And just as he stops, he, like, looks up. You just hear this weird, like... Oh, the noise. And he just gets pulled up into the ceiling as the doors close. And I have to say something that I enjoyed was that there isn't, I expected the first time I saw this for there to be the doors closing and a like flash of blood on the inside of the windows of the um, elevator. Mm -hmm. And there isn't. And that's notable later also with Will that he's just gone. Just gone. Yeah. Um, And that for some reason is so much creepier to me. Mm -hmm. It's just so much more unnerving because you're like but wait (laughs) yeah they're not being like ripped to shreds Mm -hmm. they're just gone which is creepy and that noise is creepy Mm -hmm. super super creepy it actually um the thing that it reminded me of a little bit was you didn't watch lost did you or did you see lost yes i did um okay so there you know there's a noise that the um smoke monster makes when when it approaches yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it's this weird thing that you can never really put your finger on whether it's mechanical whether it's kind of spooky you know and this is sort of a combination of spooky and electrical Mm -hmm. yep that's you know like monster but also like there's a there's a um a quality to it that isn't just like blah it's there's something weird and kind of sparky to it Mm -hmm. that is super creepy and i'm like what the fuck could that be be like it really is just i have no idea i don't know what could possibly be making that noise it's bananas what on earth is that (laughs) um so i'm really it's rare for me to come to the end of an episode of a show and be like well i have no idea what uh, Mm -hmm. i got nothing so that's exciting they really got me like "Mm -mm, i don't know that'll continue for a couple episodes i think i'm confident in saying okay that it took me a little and it's not like it's because because for some shows i feel like it's just that they don't explain well or that they are trying so hard to keep everything under wraps that they purposely mislead you right and i don't feel like this show does that but it is such a different idea that i was like oh once i realized what it was um so yeah, this this guy is gone. And yeah. just as he gets yanked up, we go to the opening credits and then we go to the little group of miscreants, mm-hmm. um, Mike, Will, and Lucas, who are playing uh, D&D. And it's almost here. It has a thirst for blood, he's saying. And Mike is the kid who lives at this house who's running the game. Will is toothless. 
and Lucas is the young black kid. And um, they are, I think. Wait, aren't there four of them? Oh, right. And then there's Will. Yeah. Bless his heart. Sorry, Will. But you, you, you get gone so quick. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so so fuck you. <laughs> okay. Oh, bless him. You're gone. Uh, he's adorable, by the way. Oh, yeah, he is. And he's so teeny. He is. He's so teeny compared to the rest of them. I like that detail. Um, so, yeah, they are playing this game, and there's this enormous monster, and they are debating how to handle it, and Will decides to roll anyway, and he loses but later on this is sort of the impetus for them to go out looking for him the fact that he chose the riskier route and put himself in harm's way for the good of the party right Um, so they feel like they have to do the same for him which mm -hmm. is cute it's really cute cute. it's so cute that they're so nerdy that they're like well in our D &D game (laughs) this is what he did at no actual risk to himself but theoretically so now we're going to do the same for him in real life when he's been stolen by a creepy monster Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just I like that part of their brain is like what happens in our D&D game is just real enough to us Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we need to extrapolate that onto our actual life to go help our friend I thought it was cute they're cute I agree um, and I feel like they're like they they do a really good job of sort of com- combining the child logic uh, with more adult decisions, mm-hmm. but in the context of how a kid would make those decisions. I feel like mm-hmm. there's a, a lot of it makes a, a ton of sense when I think about how I used to think. Yeah. Um. So. They get interrupted because Mike's parents want to have dinner. Turns out they've been playing for 10 hours. <laughs> That's insane. And uh, they get broken up and, and the other three head home. And um, there's a nice detail there at the end. Um, Lucas is the first one to break off. He lives the closest. And then um, uh, Will and I already forgot the other kid's name. Toothless. heart. Um he, he will sorry no that's will dustin dustin okay dustin is offering to race will for any comic and Ooh. owen when we watched it last night noted that the comic that will wants is the one where um what's her face becomes the the phoenix for the first time I knew Owen would know yeah. what it is <laughs> i don't know if he knew like i think he had to look it had up had to look it up but, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, this so they race, um, and Dustin gets left in the dust. Get it? And Will is heading home, and he has this moment where the headlight on his bike flickers, and this is sort of you know an indicator the the interference with electricity mm-hmm. uh, that continues throughout the. It's a, another thematic element, which I like that it's not only in a visual thing, but like you said, the sound that this thing makes mm-hmm. also plays into that a lot. Yeah. And he find he sees something standing in the road and is so startled that he just reels and falls off his bike, goes sprinting through the woods to his house. And it's such a frustrating moment because you're like, Oh, thank God his house is right there. Mm-hmm. And there's nobody home. Mm-hmm. He's all alone. This little tiny kid. And he tries to call the cops, tries to call 911. This thing is opening the locks on his door from the outside. Ugh. And he sees that, and I gotta give it to Will. He ha- keeps a level head, considering how fucking terrifying this whole thing is. Mm-hmm. You know, he goes home, he locks the door, he calls the police. Then, when he sees that they're gonna get there before he can even get through, he runs to the shed and gets a gun. Like, mm-hmm. he's not fucking around. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> he's in that shed looking at the door waiting for this thing to bust in and apparently it is already here. Mm. And he turns around and doesn't even really get a chance to scream. He's yeah. just staring and the bulb just goes out, puffs yeah. and yeah, he is gone. Um so a bunch of other stuff happens this episode, but that that is the the focus of the narrative thrust, right? 
Um, we have other character things happening, but that one is how everything sort of gets rolling. And I want to note one more thing about Will that I like, because I think it's important. You know, they do, they do a fair amount in this short period of time to give Will a little bit of a personality. So you really feel for this kid. Um, when they roll, when he rolls for a fireball or whatever in mm-hmm. the D&D game, the die goes flying somewhere else. And so they don't see what it is. Like mm-hmm. he has to get 13 or above for it to work and it goes flying off. And that's when they get called upstairs. And so, um, Mike doesn't see what the number is. The other kids do. And they're like, just don't tell him. Mm-hmm. And Will's the one who, before he leaves admits to him, he said, I got a seven. Yep. I, had to I, roll a 13 I lost. Or yeah. Yep. So, and I like that. I really like that little detail that he's like, he's not, a, he's not going to cheat. He's not going to mess around. He's just, he's such a good hearted kid that mm-hmm. he's going to come straight out and be like, Nope, I lost. I'm dead. Yeah. Like he, he was like, you know what? I willingly took the risk to roll. And, uh, if I fail, then I got to just take the fact that I failed. And um, yeah. Oh, that kind of, <laughs> And then it comes true. And then it comes true. Mm-mm. Uh, this, uh, he doesn't actually take this risk, though. This thing just comes from I him. know. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah. So, any theories on what's going on with that? Like, No, I got nothing. I'm so, <laughs> I am so, like, there's a monster. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it's there. I don't know what they're doing in this building that created this monster. I don't know how it ties into this girl that shows up later, but clearly it does. Um, I don't know why Matthew Modine's hair is that color. OMG. <laughs> I got nothing. So um, I'm, I, yeah, I got nothing. I'm um, excited to see what happens because I am really boggled. So it clearly has something to do with energy, with electricity. That's mm-hmm. all I got. So let's let's talk about the girl and Matthew okay. Modine. <laughs> um, we go b- back to the labs, and we see a bunch of people getting into hazmat suits, lowering, going down the creepy ass elevator into this basement, and. They come out and there is this growth on the walls. Yeah. Um, which appears to be alive. It's like yeah. pulsing. The only thing that reminded me of is, um, and this isn't a concept I'm super familiar with from the comics because I don't read a lot of Spider-Man and it seems to mostly be in Spider-Man, but there's something called the symbiote in Marvel comics, which is like this, cr- like a creepy mass that can sort of like, take over somebody's body like it just covers them up and then can kind of control them um so that's what like i said i don't know the details of it um because it's not in the ones that i read but i've seen enough of it that that's what sort of popped into my head that Mm -hmm. i was like uh oh (laughs) (laughs) there's a symbiote involved in this somehow and uh it's pulsing and it's creeping me out and i don't like it yeah i'm i (laughs) If, she, if you're a patron, there is a post where I basically in the comments, like, live post my reaction. And I'm pretty sure I was just like, ew, what is that? Ew, 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 ew. <laughs> just, like, completely freaking out. I was watching this by myself. And at that point, you know, didn't really, hadn't really talked to anybody else who had finished the series already. So I just decided to handle my discomfort by thrusting it in everyone else's faces <laughs> so nice of you uh, so thoughtful <laughs> um so yeah there's this thing and they're walking through looking at it apparently this is new and they mentioned the girl mm-hmm. they say the female don't they they don't even say the girl don't they say the female i'm not even sure if they say that i just i just i think they just say like is she is she gone oh, okay. or something like that and um and yeah, Matthew Modine's character who has platinum blonde hair. Um he's really reminding me of the guy from Agent Carter that we saw yesterday. I was gonna say he reminds me of the uh the scientist character from the monorail episode of The Simpsons, um, with the big shock of white hair and the black glasses. Um oh. who's the one who knows about all the different monorails. <laughs> That was that was my immediate visual reference. 
Um, but regardless, it's goofy hair. He has mm-hmm. real goofy hair, and I, <laughs> I don't know why. And um, uh, yeah, they're walking. He they're walking through, looking at this, and uh, you know, handling it very carefully. And they ask about her, and he says she can't have gone far. Mm-hmm. And then we go to this girl who is in a hospital gra- gown, shaved head, and she is walking through the woods alone, obviously having escaped, and it, she's just off, mm-hmm. you know? And this little girl, as an actress, is amazing, and I love her. Mm-hmm. And she finds her way to this diner and, like, busts into the kitchen and starts eating leftovers off of a plate sitting in there. And the diner owner, who's named, like, Butch or something. I don't even remember his name. But it was something, like, really, like, doodly. Butch or Biff or (laughs) Bill. 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 Um, my dad's name is Bill. That's not super butch. It's, I don't know. There's something, you know, cause this guy is just so big. Yeah. Uh, I was just super devastated. Yeah. Honestly. But. Because he was so nice to her. He was such a good guy mm-hmm. and trying to look out for this kid. And you know, he gets her a shirt for whatever it's worth <laughs> rather than the hospital gown. Right. And is feeding her and, you know, calls social services because he, you know, wants to make sure that she's safe and that backfires. Yes, it does. Ooh. Yeah. He thinks that she's a boy at first and it's yeah. like, Oh, you're going to steal from me. And then he sees that it's a girl. He sits her down to feed her and tries to get some answers out of her, but she's like not talking. And all she can say is 11. Mm-hmm. She points at herself and says 11. She has it tattooed on her friggin' arm. Mm-hmm. That's not creepy. Hmm. And he then calls, it's not like, it's, does the number specifically say child services? I'm trying to remember yeah, what he, it says it's, because he goes into the phone book. Something about social services or something, I think. I don't remember, I don't remember what it said in the phone book. Um, and he, you know, he's doing what a responsible person would do. Like mm-hmm. he's trying to handle this properly. It's not his fault. This is no. terrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he calls this person up. They're telling him that they're going to send somebody. And they send. They do send somebody, someone, but it's so fast that he tells them to come back later because he assumes it's a customer. Mm-hmm. So right away, there's just this little hint of like, oh, shit. Like, this isn't right. Something's right. not right. And this woman steps in as she's talking to him and very calmly unloads into his head. Mm -hmm. Like it, it happened so fast that I was startled by it. Yeah. I just gasped and was, I was so heartbroken. I can't even lie. Oh, um, and the girl freaks out, jumps down off the counter where she had been sitting, eating ice cream. And, uh, Matthew Modine, who I'm honestly not even sure what his character's name is. I'm not no, sure they don't say it. They say, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. He comes running after her and we find two other men in suits who have forks like sticking out of their foreheads. Mm-hmm. They are dead. Mm-hmm. And he's like, shit. So she has gotten away again. Um, thoughts here. Um, well, the thing that stood out to me, again, since there are X-Men references kind of going throughout, since they referenced the Phoenix and that thing on the wall seemed super Marvel comics-y, um, the fact that she's number 11 um, was interesting to me because when I'm thinking of a creepy government agency doing experiments on people, I immediately go to Wolverine, who's Weapon X, who's number oh, 10. Okay. So they've done, by the time they get to Wolverine, um, you know, it's a project done in Canada um, where they've done experiments on people to make them basically sort of the evil equivalent of super soldiers. And um, and Deadpool is one of them. Uh, you know, there's just a series of people that they've done different experiments on to try and weaponize them. And Wolverine is the 10th. And so when she said 11, I'm like, uh-oh, 
<laughs> nice. <laughs> I didn't even know, like, I didn't yeah. even know that, but that is kind of fun. I yeah. wonder if that is on purpose. It's I don't know. I mean, be. since they're, I mean, since I, I really feel like a lot of the things they're doing in this show seem really purposeful, like mm-hmm. they're thoughtful about what they're doing. And the fact that there's an earlier, you know, reference. verbalized X-Men reference, the fact that she, they're clearly doing some sort of, ex, she's some sort of experiment subject and that she's number 11 made me kind of go, Hey, <laughs> look at that. Um, maybe she's made of adamantium. Oh my God. I don't think so. <laughs> Um, oh, and I that. forgot to mention that at one point she's eating and the fan, the noise from it is bothering her. Mm-hmm. And she just looks up and stares at it and makes that shit Stop. drop dead still. Yep. Yep. So she's got something going on. Benny. That's the name of the guy. Okay. Who gets shot. Benny. Um, so that she she takes off running and later she encounters our little crew. But before we go on that, um, there are some, okay, this is the, the one thing that I find, I, I didn't warm up to right away was the deal with, uh, Mike's sister. (laughs) Um, I, she, her name is Nancy. Yeah. And she, this is a very like weirdly everyday situation going on with her right sort of thrown into the middle of this weirdness right so i think for that reason i was just kind of like oh god but it wasn't that i wasn't engaged at all because she and her friend and the twat that she's dating (laughs) are all god he's the worst right Ugh. they're all very good actors Mm -hmm. so it engaged me more than i would have expected if i saw this on paper Mm -hmm. i think but still, it is sort of this moment of going, like, what? wait, what? Yeah. Um, so the first time that we see her, Dustin's trying to give her a piece of pizza, and she shuts the door in his face. <laughs> and then at school, she's hanging out with her friend Barb, who is lamenting the fact that Nancy has been making out with this guy, and he, she's going to become too cool and not want to hang out with Barb anymore. Mm-hmm. Which... I actually really like the way this is done because this is a genuine thing that happens. Yeah. You know, friends are friends from when they're kids, but one of them outstrips the other in one way or another, whether it's just becoming sexually active earlier or becoming more attractive or successful somehow. Um, And there has to be an adjustment, whether or not you're willing to leave your other friend behind because they can't keep up with you socially or if you're going to hang back and, you know, put your friendship before your social aspirations, I guess. Right. And there are a couple other shows that have done this very successfully that it reminded me of. It reminded me of Freaks and Geeks, which is also set in sort of a similar time period. And the main character in that um, leaves her old nerdy math league friends behind to be, Mm. to hang out with the freaks. Um, And, also, it reminded me a little bit of my so-called life where, um, you know, Angela had her best friend, Sharon, from like childhood and then just couldn't do it anymore. She couldn't be that person anymore. She aspired to be like Ran, this mm-hmm. sort of weirdo. And that was I mean, both of them were sort of sexually charged in a way too. both of them had you know, a guy that they had a crush on that mm-hmm. was part of this other sort of milieu. Mm-hmm that they wouldn't be able to be part of. They, they wouldn't be able to approach this, you know, romantic subject if they were still who they'd always been and they right. needed to change and to change, they had to leave someone behind. Um, so I saw a little bit of, of that, um, both of those shows thrown in, into the mix. And what I liked about it though, is that she's insistent that she is not going to change. Mm-hmm. She's going to keep being her and this guy's still just going to have to like her for who she is. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's right, Nancy. Right. You tell her, you know, you're not, you're going to be just who you are and you know, he's going to love you anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I, I think he's a douchebag he and he wants in your pants cause you're hot. He doesn't care that you're a nerd. He cares that you're hot and he thinks you're going to be an easy mark because yep. you're a nerd and uh, you just happen to be a hot nerd. <laughs> yep. Because she is. She's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, definitely. This girl. 
in her little sweater set in her very Twin Peaksy yeah, sweater gorgeous, set. Yeah, she's gorgeous, but it's in like this ordinary, believable way. Mm-hmm. And that's and another f- thing I like about this show is that everybody cast feels like a a genuine person that you could have gone to school with. Right. Especially Barb. I mean, Barb actually almost looks a lot like the girl who was my best friend throughout <laughs> most of high school. Like, um, it was, I, I kind of stopped when I saw her and I was like, oh my God, she looks like, and then when you see what her personality is, I was like, oh my God, she actually is kind of like her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't like, Barb is meant to be a little bit more awkward and like less stylish and, right. you know, just not comfortable in her own skin quite yet. And mm-hmm. my friend wasn't as not stylish or as lacking in confidence, but it was uh, definitely the same kind of situation where I just sexually matured faster than she did. And it, I don't need like, because there's this um, earlier, you said, you know, that there's this whole thing about like whether you want to change or not. And I find it a really interesting question because it's it, at this age, I don't even consider it change. Changing. Yep. Mm-hmm. I would just, agree with that. Yeah. It's just more like you are, you are figuring it out. And right. realizing, oh, that isn't who I am anymore. Mm-hmm. And yeah. technically, yes, you're changing, but it's more that you're staying true to yourself at the same time. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's exactly how my high school experience was, was that, you know, in, in middle school, I didn't know who I was. Mm-hmm. I was, you're just flailing. You have no idea. And then you hit this point right around that, that time when you switch from middle school to high school and a lot of things change. And for me, it was very conscious like leaving middle school being like, I hated that. I hated mm-hmm. who I was. I hated the fact that people saw me as a certain thing that didn't match up with my own self image. And I don't know how to find what, how to express that self image mm-hmm. so that people understand me better. And I was like, this is an opportunity for me. Like I'm, I can make sort of a fresh start going into high school and I'm not going to change who I am, but I'm just going to figure it out. I've got more people to choose from. I'm going to find people that I actually like for who they are and who I identify with and can connect with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I can kind of leave part of that behind, but it's not like I'm changing. Mm -hmm. It's just who am I? How do I form into an actual person? Mm -hmm. Um, But Nancy seems like she's kind of, picked already (laughs) yeah she seems like she's much more self-possessed than the average person her age yeah but she wants to sort of have it both ways Mm -hmm. like she wants she's like no this is who i am i i don't want to change who i am but i still want that hot guy Mm -hmm. and i i kind of like that about her but i don't know how realistic it is yeah he's the worst I get it there's uh, later on and there is an episode where his hair you're going to die. <laughs> it is so John Ralphio. <laughs> he is very John Ralphio in the face, Most I got to say. definitely has that vibe. Mm. Yes. Oh, um, man. So, yeah, I just, like, I, I just died a little bit over that hair. It's so, it's so good. Oh, man. But, yeah, so she is talking, she's, you know, saying that we just made out a couple times, but then she opens her locker and there's a note telling her to meet him in the bathroom and then we cut to them making out. And he's pressuring her to hang out with him instead of studying, to which she's like, fat chance. And then at the last second, she's like, all right, meet me at, you know, uh, at these streets at such and such a time. Um, And he seems to be cool with that, but he had suggested earlier that he just, like, come to her house. And she just thinks he's a psychotic. Right, that's ridiculous. No. But it turns out she's not allowed to go out anyway. So he just shows up at her bedroom window, mm-hmm. which is one of those things that I think TV in general makes it look like would be so much easier than it actually is. Right, that happens all the time on TV shows. Like they shimmy up a drain pipe or like come right. in off a tree branch. And I'm like, that doesn't happen. <laughs> that shit is super hard. I had a boyfriend try and climb in my window when I was in high school. And he got caught because <laughs> my dad was walking the dog, taking him out into the backyard. And he turned around and saw my boyfriend trying to climb in my window. First story window. I, <laughs> I, I had it the most easy and I still couldn't get it right. 
And from that point on, my dad and uncles called my boyfriend Spider Man. Oh man. Yeah. That's was so super wrong. Embarrassing. Oh, it's so good. So anyway, he comes in and is really pressuring her. Oh yeah. And finally she stops and is like, Is this what you fucking wanted to do? To just come in here and get another notch on your belt, which I'm like, Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, what? Me? No. And uh, finally, you know, uh, like, agrees to just help her study. Mm-hmm. But it's a, an awkward moment where she's like, I'm not like Becky or so-and-so. And he's like, so you mean you're not a slut? And Ugh. she, for a minute, was like, that's not what I said. And he, But that's clearly what you're saying. Totally yeah. what you meant. And he says, you're so cute when you lie. Which I actually kind of liked that line. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, that's clearly what she's saying. Come right. on, lady. Um, and I'm trying to think exactly how that scene ends. I think it just ends with them. I think it kind of ends there. Yeah. I, what I have to say is sort of notable about that relationship is he's not trying at all. Like, mm-hmm. he's he's not doing anything to butter her up. He's not, you know he's not even bothering to lie to her about like how, you know, any affection he has for her or how beautiful she is or anything like that. He's just like, I'm here. I know you want to make out with me. Mm-hmm. Like he, it, it's just like, he's so entitled. Yep. He just, he doesn't even have to try because he's the big man on campus and he's super sexy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, girl, come on. Right. <laughs> like at least if you're going to, if you're going to sacrifice your values for someone, do it for somebody who at least tries to butter you up. Put some fucking effort in. Put yeah. some effort in, exactly. Other than climbing in your window and being like, here's my penis. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, come on. And Lordy. I actually really, like, it, it, this is something that I was saying in the comments on that post on Facebook, too. Um, Casey had said something about how, like, is it weird that I find this kid, like, weirdly cute? And I'm like, I think they cast him really well in that he is just cute and just charming enough that you would understand why a girl who is young and doesn't know any better is into him. Mm -hmm. As an adult, you can see so clearly that he's a total douche. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you just have such a different mindset when you're that young. Yeah. If you put yourself in her shoes, it makes total sense. Yeah. So, and you know, the combination of that, He's reasonably good looking and also that he is really popular and giving her attention that she hasn't previously had. That's a very strong drug. Yeah. And he's obviously a little bit older than she is too. Mm-hmm. Like you can, you can definitely see there's a, supposed to be a difference in their age and that makes a difference too. I mm-hmm. just got to say from, from personal experience, there's something about an older guy being into you that's sort of intoxicating. Mm-hmm. Um, even if he's not even like that into you, like he's just, he's, I it it bugged me. I was like, he he has no actual real emotional interest in you at all. Mm. Like, not even a drop of it. It's so sad. It's uh, uh, there was a guy in my when I was a freshman. Um, he was a senior, and he was in the drama club with me. His name was John, and he was not even that good looking. He was all right. But he had the swagger. You know how some people just have it, even though there's really no reason they should have it? Because they aren't that good looking? Why do we have the same life? (laughs) 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 Like, you're literally telling my life story now, and you need to stop. Ah. Because it's too weird. (laughs) Well, he, like, I, I was at this point in my life where I had just gotten out of middle school, and I was a big dork in middle school, and nobody uh-huh. ever paid any attention to me, or when they did, it was just to tease me and be real dick. Oh, yeah. Didn't realize that I was super cute yet, at all. And then this guy starts, and he, it was like, everybody in the drama club specifically was paying a lot of attention to me, but he was the oldest, he had the most swagger, he was the most forward about it. And I still remember, like, I was just standing reading something that was taped to the wall, like a notice, and he came up behind me and kissed me on the side of the neck. And 
I had never had anything, no relationship with a guy ever, and it just about melted into my chair or yeah. shoes or whatever when he did that. I was like, oh my god, like loved it. Yeah, and you know he's sweet talking to me and everything. Come to find out, this fucker has a girlfriend, and not like on the DL at all. He just didn't care, and oh. I confronted him about it like backstage and was just like, um, so. Who's Nicole? Mm -hmm. And he was like, what? <laughs> Did that, that thing where, you know, he just obviously didn't expect me to know anything about the senior class or look into it or anything like that. And I wouldn't have known if it wasn't for the fact that the girl he was dating, her little sister was in my class and uh. she had seen us flirting and basically came right up to me and was like, what the fuck are you doing with my sister's boyfriend? And I was like, Oh, what now? Mm. And, uh, yeah, I was just in such a haze that I didn't realize how wrapped up I got so mm -hmm. quick. It took nothing. And that's the thing that, you know, when you're saying, like, no, he, he's putting in no effort. It's like, it's really true. They don't have to at first because yeah. you're so lacking in self-awareness of any kind that you could do better because mm -hmm. you've never had anybody before that it doesn't even think, it doesn't even occur to you that there's other options. Other options. You're just going to fall for the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this this guy really reminds me of him. And I'll never forget, somebody took a picture of me and John together before I, like, realized that he had a girlfriend and everything. And we were just standing together and he had his arm over my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And they took the picture and it was a Polaroid. So I had, I, like, took it home because I had a massive crush on him. And I was like, oh, a picture of me and John. And my mom saw it. And she looked, she like, I remember her pursing her lips and going, who's this? Like, <laughs> John. And she goes, John is bad news. Bad news. And I was like, what? How do you know? And she's like, oh, I know. And I remember <laughs> being like, whatever. And then I found out like the next day that he had a girlfriend and I came home and was like, you were right. And she's like, yeah, moms know. There's a look <laughs> that those type of guys have. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I kind of listened to my mom a little bit more from then on, I have to say. <laughs> Good job, mom. Yep. It was because she didn't try and be like, you're never talking to him again. She just had this sort of like, oh, fuck. You know, like, which I'm sure is exactly how you and I would act it once our once oh, I don't even want to talk daughter. about it like don't like the <laughs> idea my daughter came home a couple months ago and was like I have a crush on someone and my husband was like I'm I uh I gotta leave the house and take a <laughs> walk like he's like you, you're seven and I'm like come on when you were seven you had crushes on girls like it's just you know it's a little thing but mm -hmm. like it was just this tiny moment of oh god that's this is it's gonna keep happening and it's gonna get worse and it's gonna get more important and it's gonna get disastrous and then it's gonna get awful and i ah yeah. so yeah i'm i'm looking forward to whichever bad news guys she brings home pictures of when she's 14 and i can just vomit into a bucket and like have <laughs> horrible flashbacks in my own life like i karma is gonna hit me like a fucking mac truck and i'm not looking forward to it at all because oh, I, I got it coming to me. I really do. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> yeah. I love that so much. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> it's just the worst. Like, I talk to my mom sometimes, and I'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, because <laughs> I know it's just going to come back at me. And she's like, yep, it is. Have fun. Yep. Too late now, bitches. Oh, God damn it. Why? Why couldn't I have been well behaved and listened to my parents as a teenager? Nope, I didn't. Because that's not the point no. of being a teenager. But some people did it. I don't understand them, but they did. That's the thing, though. Nobody actually did it all the time. They just picked the things they rebelled yeah. about. Yeah, you know? I, I didn't pick and choose. I was just a disaster across <laughs> the board. So, like, I didn't start drinking until I like drank for the first time in college, and then I didn't drink again for ages because i got so disgustingly drunk drinking oh, no. smoking weed nothing like that was an issue boys forget it uh, forget it lost my virginity when i was 14 years old didn't regret it for a second just I even get had, that shit out of the way i was just like oh my god can i please i just need to have sex oh my fucking god <laughs> and i remember somebody like making a snide comment about the fact that i had slept with like more than one guy in the drama club and they were trying to slut shame me and i remember 
I was more irritated at the fact that they like knew because they weren't even in the drama club, mm. but I didn't act. I wasn't ashamed. Like the slut shaming right. attempt didn't work because didn't I was hit. just like, yeah. well, yeah, I did. Like, and it was fun yeah. as hell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so. That's one of those things that people sometimes are like, well, you'll look back and you'll regret it. And I'm like, nope, mm. I don't though. <laughs> Not even a little but bit. Nope. But nope. Nope. Yeah. Even if one of them turned out to be gay, he was super hot. <laughs> super hot. <laughs> uh, okay, well, anyway, back to the actual show. Big tangent, big tangent. Um, that's fine. But, you know, some things in even crazy spooky shows are going to hit home, mm -hmm. and uh, this kind of did. But I'm sure it's going to get super weird at some point. It's not going to keep just being like, and there's this subplot where this girl has a boyfriend who's a douchebag. Like, it's going to get weird. So I'm I'm excited to see how it's going to get weird because I know it will. And like you said, the fact that they make it a little different where she is already self-possessed and she sticks to it. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't she let does. him pressure her. She stops him and is like, fuck you. Yeah. It's yeah. a nice change. Good job, Nancy. Yeah. Um, let's give it up for Nancy because good job. Yeah. And let's see. I feel like that's about it with Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to the... Um, I'm forgetting Will's last name, and I'm having to look it up now. Um, oh, Byers. Right. So let's go back to the Byers household. Um, right. And that kind of ties in with the sheriff, I would say. Right. Like, that's his main plot line is the intersection between the two of them. So I guess we can do all that sort of in a chunk. Don't ever say chunk. I'm sorry. I did <laughs> say chunk the other day, too. What is the matter with me? I think you said something another word before chunk that made it even worse oh god i don't even like maybe like massive chunk or something, something like that <laughs> i think or see i think you said like meaty chunks or something and i was just like <laughs> no chunks i okay but fine i'll stop sometimes i just do you get into that where like you'll just say the same word a yes. lot for like a week and you don't really know why i think everybody who listens to my podcast knows that i do that. yeah and then you, i'm like why do i keep saying it um like, I, I had to actively try not to call everything a dumpster fire for a while. Because <laughs> I was like, I'm just, ev but everything is a goddamn dumpster fire. So that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I'll stop. If I say chunk again, just, you know, hang up. <laughs> <We're> like, we're done. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if I actually did that? I didn't come <laughs> like, back and that was just where the podcast ended. <laughs> and everybody's like checking their earbuds, like, wait, wait. Like, what? <laughs> And then you, there's, like, a public service announcement from you at the end. Like, I'm sorry, guys. We had to stop. <laughs> I'm sure everybody appreciates and understands. <laughs> Mag Maggie keeps saying that word, and so we're done. I'm confident we'll there is no audience disagreement on this. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you in a couple days. Yep. Uh, when Maggie has thought about her life choices. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah. So Joyce uh, is rushing out to go to work in the morning. Her... Older son is making eggs for himself and his little brother who hasn't got up, gotten out of bed yet. I and, love that too, by the way, that he's making breakfast mm -hmm. for him. That's adorable. He, he's making breakfast and, you know, when he says he didn't get home till late, you think he's going to be out partying. No, he took a late shift, mm -hmm. which when he says this, this is clearly something he and his mother have talked about already, that he shouldn't do that. But he says, I thought we needed the money. Yeah. So there's just this, you know, the, this real vibe of a kid who just hasn't been able to be a kid for a little while now. Yeah. Who feels this real sense of responsibility yep. towards his mom and towards his brother, which is really super sweet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you can see it, it's, it must be so hard for Joyce to balance like, yes, it's great that my son has this sense of responsibility, but I, I, and I, but I hate that he feels like he has to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, poor, this poor woman. Oh right. my God. Oy. Um, so yeah, so he hasn't gotten his brother out of bed and she's running around like a chicken with her head cut off, mm -hmm. like trying to deal with all this stuff and goes up to his room and, uh, uh Oh, yep. He's not there. No, he's not. And then she calls Mike's house. Not there. 
And, yeah. and she quickly, like, because the Mike's mother is like, did he not come home? And she's like, oh, I'm sure he just went to school early. Like, it's right. clearly one of those, I don't want to seem like a bad mom who doesn't know where her kid is. Uh, right. Um, and when, and she, you know, she goes and asks her son, like, did you see him? Like, what, do you know anything? And he has no idea because he came home really late. And he is just as surprised as she is that he's not in his room. Um, his name is Jonathan, by the way. Okay, okay. Um, and then we cut to the police chief getting out of bed. Um, I'm trying to find his name because I keep wanting to call the other guy. Okay, yeah, Lonnie Byer. Um, or no, Lonnie was her ex-husband. Sorry. Right. I'm trying to, because she calls him trying oh. to find something out. And his girlfriend answers the his phone. His girlfriend answers, and she calls back and leaves a message, and is like, "Some teenager hung up on me." Oh my god! She's <laughs> oh so no! Good. She's so irritated. Uh -oh. Um, do, 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 I'm trying to find where the head is. What the sheriff's name is? Um, I'm just going to refer to him as Sheriff Truman, who's the sheriff from Twin Peaks, because it's, it's like having, you know, this sort of rural sheriff's office. Jim with Hopper. Okay. This, yes. What's his name? Jim Hopper. Holler? Hopper. H-O-P-P-E-R. -P -P -E okay. okay. Um, you know, it's just another really clear Twin Peaks reference, okay. you know. Um, but the sheriff's uniform is exactly the same, and he's got a couple of, you know, cops who work under him. Um, and... Uh, but he's kind of a mess in the mm -hmm. morning, yep. which is not the way the sheriff is in Twin Peaks at all. Um, he's much more pulled together. This guy's rough. Yeah, this he's waking up, obviously, with a bad hangover. He rolls into work, and he's the last one to get there. Mm -hmm. He is much more preoccupied with getting a coffee and a donut into him than, oh, God, that sounds fucking amazing, actually. I think I may have to go buy donuts after we're done. Oh, shush. No, oh, no, I'm going to have to buy donuts. God damn it, Natasha. <sighs> we, can, we can bond over donuts. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and when the secretary says that Joyce Byers called, her son is missing, he's very confident that this isn't a big deal. Yeah. And, and just t keeps on being like, flow mornings are for quiet and contemplation. <laughs> and just walks away from her and like closes his office door in her face, basically. Mm -hmm. But Joyce comes to the station. Right. And is like, I've been waiting to hear from you for a fucking hour. And again, he is, and it's understandable as a cop, m as he says, 99% of the time a kid is with a parent or relative. Right. He has a way that he handles this, and most frequently it goes that way. Right. However, I really do think there is something to be said for maternal instinct, and she right. knows something isn't right. Right. And she knows her ex-husband, and that the last thing he would do is just show up <laughs> come and come up take, and take her kid. Again. Yeah. yeah. So he's continually trying to push that she contact him and find out to make sure. And she's like, it's so not even, it's so not him. Like, I right. promise you. And he's like unwilling to move on unless she's exhausted that particular possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and he then begins to take a look around. He goes to the house. He sees that... Um, he finds the bike in the woods. Yeah. And that's what really sets his alarm bells off. Right. That He's like, uh-oh, this is actually out of the norm. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. like, if this kid, because at first he thinks that he maybe he's just playing hooky, but if he were, his bike would be with him. Right. You know, this is their main mode of transportation in a suburban area where it's a pain in the ass to walk everywhere. And one of the guys is like, well, was he, you know, was he hurt when he fell off the bike? And he's like, not enough to not run away, but if he hadn't if he was able to run usually they'd take the bike with them because these are like a cadillac to them mm -hmm. and they he follows the tracks to the house and then notices the bashed like dent behind the doorknob right asks if it's been there she isn't sure but this really gets his attention and he goes into the shed like he's got really good instinct yeah it's just that there's no evidence to support what he's saying mm -hmm. like it's just circumstantial that dent could have been there she doesn't even know 
um, he goes into the shed, and really there's not actually anything wrong. It's just that the light is weird and there's a vibe. Mm -hmm. He picks up a, the light, like overhead light goes out, which startles him a little bit. He gets a flashlight and is peering around. Obviously feels something mm -hmm. in this place, but can't put his finger on it. And then one of the cops comes in and the light turns back on and it's just like he jumps out of his skin. Right. He's real flipped out, which I actually really liked. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that we're going to organize a search party. I want everybody to get like get as many people involved as possible and bring flashlights. And one of the guys is like, is this a problem? And I'm like, you fucking think? Like, he doesn't <laughs> even deign to answer the guy because he's just like, oh, whatever, brain dead. <laughs> and I'm trying to think if there's anything more with that this episode. I think that's it, is him deciding to do the search party, right? Yeah. And then um, there's, I don't know where exactly the scene is when um, the phone rings and Joyce answers right. it. And it's, and it's the creepy fucking noise. Yep. And she starts screaming and crying and is convinced it's Will. Like, she's like, I know... I know it's Will, I know it's Will, I know it's Will, and mm -hmm. starts crying, and um, Jonathan needs to comfort her, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Right? <laughs> She's a uh, poor woman. Any poor theories woman. on that? No, I don't know what the <laughs> thing is. It's so, I have nothing. I don't know. Um, I mean, her, like, when I heard the noise i was like oh it's the creepy thing but then when she's like it's will i'm like has will been taken over by the symbiote what's happening right. i really i got nothing i'm so confused and i'm i really want to know what's happening and i'm the unspoiled one this time and it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> See, aren't you glad that we're doing this in accelerated format this is what uh, i mean yeah. like waiting week to week this particular story would there are some me. stories that would be fine like that that are fine but this it would kill me it really yeah. would yeah um and well, it's like when I watch Twin Peaks, I watch it all, like, in a row. I like, have you, never you seen Twin Peaks. I know you yeah. haven't, but, like, you can't watch the first two episodes and not be like, okay, well, I'm going to watch all of it. Or at least, like, the first 15 or so. How you got to watch them all. How many are there? 20-something. They did – the first season is, is short. The first season, I think, is only, like, eight episodes. But then the second season is a full season. Okay. But really only the first – half of the second season or maybe not even a full half of it um has to do with the original mystery they kind of solve or you know solve in quotation marks what happened but the the themes sort of continue throughout but then there's a whole other sort of second plot line that pops up during the second season that's not as successful and that's where it kind of lost all its viewership and everybody was like, eh, okay, never mind." Yeah. Um, but the last episode of Twin Peaks brings the original plot line back in a lot and um, is a really successful final episode. Mm -hmm. It ends on a really creepy cliffhanger. So I'm excited for the Twin Peaks uh, miniseries that they're coming out with soon that should, um, that, you know, is set 25 years later or whatever. Um, because there will finally maybe be a weird answer to the weird cliffhanger that they left us on in 1991. Is the miniseries by Netflix? Who is that by? Uh, Showtime, Showtime, I think. Showtime, okay. Yeah. But it's all the original cast members and David Lynch is directing everything. Wow. So, yeah. Which originally he was going to do it and then he dropped out because they weren't going to either give him the money or the freedom or both to do exactly what he wanted to do. And the whole cast balked. They were all like, we're not doing it without him. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and so they were like, all right, give him what he wants. So he did it. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited. I really think you should watch it at some point, even if you don't cover it, because it, it would be a pretty big undertaking to cover. It would be fun. But I know that it's not as easy for you as just like, oh, I'll cover it. Um, but it's a, it's a really weird show and if you like this weird show you'd like that weird show well maybe if this is a successful enterprise we can do a uh, fundraiser for covering twin peaks oh man i would cover twin peaks with you in a hot second <laughs> <laughs> all right guys you heard it here first uh, i love that show it's so uh, weird <laughs> well yeah this like not only does the phone ring and she hears breathing she hears this creature sound and she's yelling, what did you do to my boy? Right. Jonathan is right there, and he can't hear what's 
he sees her freaking out, but he can't hear anything. And she's screaming into the phone, and all of a sudden, there's a spark. Right. And she's forced she to drop that. the phone, yeah. and the phone just goes dead. Right. Um, so, yeah, that creeped the shit out of me. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, completely. And this is actually, because you had said earlier, like, this could be taking place at any time. Technically true. I see what you mean. But there are a lot of little things like that moment that wouldn't really work now. Oh, man, that, the, the, the corded phones are always mm-hmm. super fun. The corded <laughs> like, phones, there's like... Somebody who had a corded phone mounted on the wall, like, it's just such a... It, that is a nostalgia little thing that just gives you a little bit of warmth in your heart. Like, oh, right. it's got a dial. It actually has a dial. It makes sense to say I dialed such and such number. It doesn't make sense to children anymore. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, what a I dial. Guess so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, although I don't know if that, that phone might have push buttons. I didn't notice. But um, just the, the concept of the phone on the wall is very 1983. I think it is rotary because I think yeah. I remember when he was trying to dial 911 when he ran he was, home. He was actually dialing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which was always so obnoxious. Like, why would you make the emergency number one that you have to start with a nine? <laughs> Go all the way around. Sorry, this is just me being pissed off from like being five years old and being like, that makes no sense. Did you ever watch the IT crowd? Uh, no. Oh, okay. There's a, there's at one point an advertisement that's going on in the background that they've changed the, in Britain, it's obviously not 911, but mm. they changed the emergency number to this like 11 digit long number. <laughs> and they have like a jingle for it that, Nobody could possibly remember, right. except of course the one guy who's into computers totally remembers it. Yeah, sure. Um, That's funny. <laughs> and yeah, so this the phone thing, and also the fact that there's not cameras everywhere, mm-hmm. which I feel yeah. like that would really interfere. And that's something that I I, I feel like is a serious. Um, obstacle for me suspending disbelief on a lot of shows that are set in the present day uh-huh. is that there will frequently be things like, well, and nobody knows where he went. And I'm like, bullshit. There's cameras yeah. everywhere. Now you could find out where he went in about three seconds. Well, and that happens all the time. I, I remember the first show that it came up in discussion a lot, uh, was, was Buffy because they were like, it makes no sense that these people would not have cell phones and mm-hmm. not just be able to like, call each other and be like, hey, there's a vampire here. Like, it it doesn't doesn't make any sense that Buffy would not be carrying a cell phone with her because it's, you know, in 1998 or 97, when that show started, there were cell phones. Giles would give his his slayer a cell phone so she could call him. Um, And, you know, it went on well into the time when people would have a cell phone and it just never made any sense. Um, But it it had to be that way for the plot to work, that Mm -hmm. that people needed to be isolated and have no way of contacting each other. It just didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. But it, so setting it in the past here, I suppose, definitely gets rid of those sorts of things where you're like, that doesn't make sense. Um, I think there's, on uh, there's Daredevil, too, there was something where we were like, but there would totally be a camera there. Like, I, th- I don't remember if it was Daredevil or not, but I f- feel like it was something that we were talking about, like, specifically we both got kind of hung up on. Um, and yeah, so I think that helps setting it in this era when that just wasn't as much of a thing. Right. Um, but yeah, the use of electricity too, like I feel like if it were set in the present day, that would change things because of computers and and self and the fact that there's imaging and whatnot, it would change. So Having it just be a little bit more of a simplistic analog sort of thing makes yeah. it a, uh, somehow much more creepy, too. Yep, yep, I agree. Um, so, okay, then to finish this up, um, they, the family, um, the Wheeler family, which is the one where the D&D was taking place, mm-hmm. they're having dinner and arguing about the fact that they're not letting Mike go out to look for his friend. Uh, Nancy wanted to go out and meet her boyfriend, which Mike totally throws her under the bus and announces yeah. in front of everybody. Um, and she calls him a douchebag and gets up and leaves. <laughs> and he's saying, like, I'm the only one who even cares about Will. And his father, how good is this fucking guy? Oh, man. 
Oh my God, he's insufferable. <laughs> oh, we care, son, as he's still eating his chicken. Right. Can't even like stop putting food in his mouth for a second to even say the words. And he just looks at his dad. It's like he's too young to really verbalize what it is. My cat is being super loud. I'm sorry. It's okay. He's too young to really verbalize what it is that's like bothering him about how his father is reacting. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that his wife could, but she's just not going to fucking bother because she's so tired, probably, of Mm -hmm. trying to explain to him that she just gets up and is like, I hope you're enjoying your chicken and leaves with the baby. Um, Oh, that baby is funny. (laughs) They keep keep cutting to the baby like, what? Oh, my God. What's happening? You know that, like, meme of that, like, confused toddler in the car seat making that goofy, like, what face? Like, that's all I could think of was this child is like, what? Why? Why, though? (laughs) Um, So kudos to whoever that little baby actor is. (laughs) She was cracking me up. I'm looking at this, the actor... um who plays his dad. His name is Joe Crest and I'm checking out his IMDb out of pure curiosity. Yeah. I looked him up. He's been in a million things. Yeah. He was an Ant-Man. What? I don't know. Yeah. I don't he's remember that at all. Random character actor. Who's just been in a million things. 21 oh. jump street, the aviator. Okay. Um, Oh, and he was in the hunger games mocking Jay part two. Ah, uh. what a bunch of weird things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his just but this total like dispassionate, uninvolved parental totally figure, uninvolved. like yeah. Because later, or earlier, Mike is trying to convince his mom to let him play a little bit longer, and he mm-hmm. hasn't even gotten to ha- get the words out of his mouth. He just starts to say, "Dad, don't you think that mom?" Sh-? And he just goes, "I think you should listen to your mother," oh, without man. even looking up from adjusting the antenna on the television. Oh man, and the antenna on the television, that's a fun little yes. uh, visual treat too. Um, you may actually be to, did you ever have an antenna on your TV? Yes. Or did you always have cable? Okay. Yes, um, when I was very young. Yeah, because I'm a couple, I mean, I'm not that much older than you, but uh, like, it's just this tiny little age difference where like a lot of stuff changed in a really mm-hmm. short period of time. But like, we had a black and white TV with a dial and the antenna and like the whole shebang. Um, so, you know, yeah, and I'm also the fact that- I'm trying to think if that, any of our TVs were black and white. I don't know, I think maybe we had a small one that was like- Yeah, that's what we had, yeah. like a small black and white one that like my dad kept- where his tools were and stuff so he could watch baseball games and it was an old black and white one with the antenna um and then we had like there was a nicer one obviously in the living room um that still had a dial on it though um i'm trying to think what else because like yeah owen was born in 1990 i don't want to talk about owen oh my, being born oh my god like every time like oh i can't <laughs> like i love owen he's great he, but you know, we have we have a surprising number of things in common, given that he is literally twelve years old. And, oh, <laughs> bless his heart. Seriously, bless his heart. Honestly, I had no idea how young he was until it was I know, too late. I know you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> me up. I found out. I was like, wait, what? Wait, wait, yeah, what? What? I didn't either because I knew him as your boyfriend first, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, she couldn't possibly be dating someone. And he made some reference about like. I posted some picture of myself in 1996 and he made some joke about, you know, in 1996 I was wearing something or other. And I was like, Oh, ha ha. And then I was like, Oh wait, you're serious. (laughs) You were six. (laughs) I was in high school. I was doing very different things in 1996. Um, But yeah, it's a totally different frame of reference um, for somebody who was born in the nineties. It's totally, uh, totally different. So this show for him must be like, what? Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't, it, it, it's, it must be a really different viewing experience for people who actually were alive for this. I mean, I was very young, but I remember this sort of lifestyle. Um, and I think that it's also helped that I had a much older sister. And so, so many of my, cultural reference points are tied to her experiences. So I remember stuff a lot younger. Um, But for people who are watching this, who are like still in their twenties, 
maybe that's why the reaction on some groups has you know described it as a nostalgia piece. It's because it's so foreign that the stylistic elements of it are really like this seems really really old. Maybe. Whereas to me, I'm like, yeah, this is within my, you know. I feel like the person who made sense. that comment was older than me, honestly. Okay. But well, I don't know. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, it's, I totally get what you Some mean, people, yeah. it must be so foreign. Like, oh, my so God, people lived like that. That's crazy. And I'm like, no, yeah, we did. <laughs> I, That's how it was. There were phones on the walls and TVs had antennas. And, yeah. I mean, I honestly stop sometimes and think about just randomly in this situation that I'm in right now without technology, what would I do? Oh, God. And I well, just think about what a pain in the ass everything was and how – much of the time you just wandered around wondering something and not able to remember it because you couldn't look it up. Yeah. There was a joke about that on how I met your mother once about how like everybody having smartphones has just ruined conversation because it used to be like, you could be out with your friends and pose a question like, Hey, what's the most common food in the world? And you'd all be like, huh, it could be this. It could be this. And you hypothesize. And instead you just like pull out your phone and you like type five letters and you go, it's bread. <laughs> That's Lame. It. And we're done. Lame. <laughs> like there's there's no conversation anymore. See, like the me, questions are doesn't all even count as an answer. I know, but like Hot every dogs. answer to everything is at your fingertips in a second, you know? Yeah, that's true. It's you know, it used to be like you'd watch a movie and you'd be like, Who is that guy? What have I seen that guy in? And you'd actually have to sit and think about it and mm -hmm. try and figure it out and not just type I M D B. <laughs> that's it. Like there it is. That's what I know that guy from. Done. It's we're so lazy. <laughs> I have to be honest though, with because like if I recognize somebody, I really don't like to look it up. I, I try. I sit yeah. there and try and remember. I will also try. I'll try too. But like if you hit a block, you can you find can out. You can find out. Yeah. That's it. Or like this guy. I mean, I didn't know anything that he. I. It wasn't you even still that he look looked at it familiar and you're still to me. Like, I don't know what any what he was in any yeah. of those. But it's still, it's interesting to like look up one actor from this show and be like, he's been in nothing. And then see this guy and be like, who's that? And then see, you know, 80 credits and be like, well, I don't know who he is from any of these things, but he's obviously done a ton of work. So The thing yeah. that I remember the most, though, about not having technology is that my dad was always late for everything. And he would <laughs> always try and do more than he could really. Men are very bad, I've noticed. And I'm going to say it, like the men that I've dated, my dad Oh, and right now are not as good at accurately estimating how long things take to accomplish. No, they are not. And I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't, I'm not really sure what that is. Oh no. But it, it really is like, links. Yeah. my dad would be like, oh yeah, um, I'll be home in like 20 minutes. Meanwhile, he's a 40 minute drive away and he plans at stopping at the grocery store before he comes home. Right? It makes but he no still sense. says 20 minutes. Like, why? Yeah. No, my husband one time, my favorite about this is that his sister was in town and she was at a bar at a, in a town that's literally 25 minutes away. And he was going to go out and meet her. And he's like, I'll just have one drink. So I'll be back in an hour. And I'm like, what? How are you going to have like one shot and then be like, all right, bye. bye. And get back to your car. Like, no. It t it's going to take you like half an hour to get there, park, get in, say hello, order a drink. That's a half an hour right mm -hmm. there. And then you have to do it on the way back. So no, you're not going to be back in an hour. You're insane. That makes no sense. Like do the math. You're a physicist. Come <laughs> on. I don't get it. I don't know. Something I don't that know. I really ties in, I think ties into men you just saying can't. whatever yeah. like sounds good at the time yeah. without really like, you they know, do, and it's something yeah. that comes up a lot in dating is men just say what they think sounds good because they, you know, want to make a good impression without actually taking into account the reality. <laughs> but yeah, so this is something that uh, I've noticed with with all men. Owen's better about it than most. Brennan was real bad. But yeah, it's like you have a phone. Yep. You, you know what time it is. Get it together. But yeah, in the past, I mean, my dad wouldn't be able to text us and be like, oh, I stopped here or oh, I'm here. Right. It was just... Oh, I'll be home in 20 minutes. And an hour later, we're like, what the fuck? Crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, tangent again. But yeah. the episode basically ends with the phone call and with her freaking out. Um, right. And, the and then zap. Yeah. Right. So, Hi. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm oh, yeah. I'm super excited. We're getting into yeah. some good stuff. Um, 
I'm not going to do the whole announcement thing or, you know, reading of new patrons and whatnot on this show since this is experimental. Right. I just want to encourage everybody, if you enjoyed this episode, if you loved Stranger Things, if you want to keep this going, if you want to encourage me to cover more Netflix shows and just, like, kind of drop them into my schedule when I can. In, like, a binge format. Exactly. Um, unspoiled. I need to figure out, like, a good name for, like, a binge. Un, un, unsobered is one that Chris Tex Holcomb suggested, which yeah. I really enjoyed. It doesn't quite work, but something like that. I'm going to figure it out. Okay. Um, but, yeah, guys, go to Facebook.com backslash Unspoiled Pod and click the link that's pinned to the top to donate and make this happen. Share it with other people that you know enjoyed the show. And um, I, I just want to – I really want to meet our goal and uh, also compensate Maggie because it's going to be it's going to be intense. Nine yeah. o'clock in the morning for me to get up and record this, guys. This is yeah. a labor of love. And I'm about to jump in my car and go get my kids from camp. So right. this is a shove it's it into our it schedule, in. figure it out sort of situation. So. Exactly. Um, so thank you, Maggie, for fitting it in and agreeing to do this. I really, really, really appreciate it. I'm super excited. Yeah, I am too. I hope we get to keep doing it. Me too. All right, everybody. Make